We continue with our assessment of our patient. And you see a photograph of our patient there. He has COPD with primarily chronic bronchitis from many years of cigarette smoking. We've conducted the interview. We've evaluated his vital signs. And now we're ready to systematically examine his chest and lungs by inspection and palpation. And then on the next part of this lecture, we'll continue with percussion and auscultation of his chest. It's important for us to review this material, even though you've had it already in procedures, because as we begin to study the various pathologic problems, such as COPD, we need to recognize the abnormal findings and be able to relate those to the problem. And then from that, we recommend a treatment plan as well as diagnostic testing. So now let's go on to the inspection and palpation of our patient's chest. The sequence that's used to systematically examine the chest and lungs has traditionally begun with inspection of the chest, followed by palpation, followed by percussion, and then lastly, auscultation. The physician who taught me these components referred to these steps as IPPB and to make it easy to remember B meaning breathing. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, topography of the chest on the next slide before we go on to our uh, details, to the details of inspection of the chest. What's well, important that we we'll be able to locate lib ribs to be able to identify underlying structures as we examine the patient's chest. So your author starts with the the um, thoracic cage landmarks. He describes that the first rib is attached to the manubrium. And you all learned that then the manubrium connects to the sternum at the angle of Lewis. And that's where the second rib is attached. So those two landmarks helps us identify uh, those underlying structures so we can count the ribs from there. He also points out the sixth rib is attached to the sternum just above the xiphoid process. And then when we examine the and find those uh, landmarks on the back of the chest, we find those prominent spinous processes at the base of the neck. The top one would be the seventh cervical vertebra, and the bottom one is T1. And if he points out that if sometimes you can only see one spinous process is most like, or I'm sorry, not C, yeah. Yes, I do mean C, sorry. Uh, if you just see one spinous process, that's usually C7. So that allows us to count the ribs on the back of the chest, the posterior aspect of the chest, to locate underlying st uh, structures. Continuing with our discussion of topography of the chest and lungs, <clears throat> in order for us to be able to document what we find uh, with examination of the chest, we need to identify landmarks, sometimes referred to as planes of the chest, P-L-A-N-A-S. Your author refers to these as imaginary lines, so we can't see them. <laughs> so on the anterior part of the chest, we have the mid-sternal line and then the left mid-clavicular line. And we have learned that the point of maximal impulse, for example, is in the fifth intercostal space. And we find the fifth intercostal space by locating the ribs. First rib attached to the manubrium. Second rib attached to the uh, angle of Lewis, where the manubrium connects with the sternum. And then we count the ribs down to the fifth rib on the left side, find the intercostal space just below the fifth rib, 
and that's where we expect to find the point of maximal impulse. So that's how we use imaginary lines to locate and document our physical findings. Other planes of the chest that we refer to refer to the axillary line. So we have the mid axillary line, the anterior axillary line, and the posterior axillary line. And we use those landmarks again to help us uh, to locate not just anatomical structures, but also to identify where chest tubes may be placed or where sensors for ECG, the 12 lead ECG, need to be placed, as well as finding those underlying landmarks for us to be able to document our uh, findings from examination of the chest. Then the last reference is to the posterior aspect of the chest, simply finding the mid part of the sternum, or sorry, not the sternum, the uh, spine. And your author refers to, to, to the vertebral line, also called the mid-spinal line. And then you have the mid-scapular -sca uh, scap line that runs through the middle of the scapula and either the right or left side, parallel to the spine. So those are the planes of the chest that we use to uh, help us locate and document our physical findings from examination of the chest. So in order to document our findings from examination of the lungs by auscultation and by palpation and percussion, then we need to be, once we locate the ribs, we can identify the underlying lobes of the lung, looking at the right lung first from the anterior aspect. The horizontal fissure is, starts at the mid-clavicular line and extends around, to the, around the front along the fourth rib down to the fifth rib. So between the fourth and fifth rib, we find the right middle lobe anteriorly, and we can't find the right middle lobe on the posterior aspect of the chest. Then the oblique fissure separates the middle lobe from the lower lobe on the right and extends all the way around to about T3 in the back. So when we move around to the back on the right side, we find the upper lobe from about T3 up, T3 or T4 up, and then we find the lower lobe from about uh, below T3 or T4. Also, I want to point out that the lungs usually don't extend beyond this, uh, below the sixth rib. And, and again, that's normally. Then when we look at the left lung, the anterior, the, uh, there's only two lobes. We have the upper lobe and lower lobe. And then the oblique fissure is about at the same place on the left lobe, left lung as it is on the right and extends around to the back to about T3 or T4. So by identifying first the ribs, then as we listen to the chest, we can locate those findings that are related to the underlying structure. So if we're listening to the chest in anteriorly ab above the fourth rib on the right, we're listening to the upper lobe. And of course, we you learn that it's difficult to sometimes as auscultate the middle lobe on women in particular. But on a man, of course, you listen to the chest between the fourth and fifth rib anteriorly, and you're listening to the middle lobe. And then in order to auscultate the uh, posterior lobe, we must be able to, uh, um, not posterior lobe, lower lobes. In order to effectively evaluate the lower lobes, we need to listen to the uh, posterior aspect of the patient's chest below the third and fourth ribs. Okay. So we have finished our discussion of topography of the chest lung borders with lung borders and fissures. And now we'll go on to 
inspection of the chest. The inspection of the chest. We start observing the patient's breathing when we walk in the room or during a uh, physical examination of the patient. During our interview, we've been observing the patient's ventilatory pattern. So your author lists a number of common clinical manifestations observed during inspection on this slide and on the next slide. And then the uh, author spent dedicate most of this chapter on inspection of the chest, which starts on page 25, and your author refers to that this part of the discussion as an in-depth discussion of common clinical manifestations observed during inspection. So we're going to go through this list of uh, signs and symptoms of that we want to make note of during the um, inspection of the chest, and then we'll go on to palpation of the chest. So let's go down this list. Abnormal ventilatory pattern, and remember we're, we're going to go into more detail uh, at the end of this lecture. Whether or not the patient is using their accessory muscles to inspire and expire, both signs of increased work of breathing, of course, pursed lip breathing, Substernal or intercostal retractions, which are a physical finding associated with increased negative pressure in the thorax due to increased work of breathing. Nasal flaring, which we don't see very often in adults, but if you look closely, sometimes you can. We see it frequently in infants. Splinting or decreased chest expansion caused by chest pain. So this is, you know, those patients who've had broken ribs in particular, for example, they don't want to take a deep breath because it hurts. Or they've had upper abdominal surgery and they don't want to take a deep breath because it hurts. That's splinting. Abnormal chest shape and configuration. Of course, that's our patient with kyphoscoliosis, kyphosis, scoliosis, or increased AP diameter, also known as a barrel chest. Okay, we'll complete this list on the next slide. So continuing our list of clinical manifestations observed during inspection. Abnormal extremity findings, altered skin color, that is, could be one we think of first as cyanosis. Of course, we also want to consider normal findings, and then we want to uh, consider other ch um, changes in color, such as pale or mottled, M-O-T-T-L-E-D. We look for evidence of digital clubbing, which you all learned is an indication of chronic hypoxemia, which we see most often in patients with cystic fibrosis or patients with uh, chronic heart conditions. Pedal edema, which is swelling of the ankles up through the knees, often associated with uh, heart failure. Stick distended neck veins, which you learned as jugular venous distension, or JVD, associated with right heart failure, which is caused by pulmonary vasoconstriction of the pulmonary capillary bed and that's due to chronic hypoxemia. And then last on the list is cough. And your author says no characteristics that we're referring to is the cough productive or dry. And if it is productive, be able to describe this, this sputum in terms of quantity, consistency, and color. OK, now we go on to um, examination of the chest by palpation. The emphasis on this slide is tactical and, tactile and vocal primitives. We'll begin, though, with a general description of the assessment of the chest by palpation by noting that the 
symmetry of the chest expansion can be uh, assessed, and we'll take that up in more detail. Position of the trachea, and to evaluate the position of the trachea, you would place your index finger over the sternal notch and gently move it from side to side. The trachea should be in the midline directly above the sternal notch. Those conditions that would cause the deviation of the trachea from its normal position include a tension pneumothorax, which pushes the trachea away from the affected side. So if the tension pneumothorax is on the left, the trachea would be shifted and deviated to the right. Uh, that is also true for a very large pleural effusion. So whether you have a large amount of air in the pleural space or a large amount of fluid in the pleural space, on the affected side, for example, that occurred on the right side, you'd expect the trachea to be deviated to the left. On the other hand, atelectasis, which causes lung volume loss on the affected side would cause the trachea to deviate toward the air side of that lexus. And those are the those particular findings are especially important when we have a patient and it's on a ventilator and it's an acute condition and is deteriorating to be able to determine whether the problem in the lexus that should that may occur when the endotracheal tube shifts down into the right main stem bronchus or whether there's a uh, pneumothorax, which may, which may be a life-threatening condition that needs to be determined and treated immediately. Other findings from palpation of the chest include noting the, whether or not the patient feels uh, febrile or not, areas of tenderness, and other uh, abnormal findings from this palpation of the chest. Your author suggests that when you're palpating the chest, you use the heel or, or ulnar side of the hand, the palms, or the fingertips. Okay, uh, then we'll take up uh, tactical, tactile and vocal feminists again in more detail on the next slide. Okay, more details on findings from palpation of the chest that are described as frambidus. So we can palpate vibrations through the chest wall that occur when gas flows through thick secretions obstructing the large airway. By auscultation, these same changes would be heard as coarse, low-pitched crackles that may or may be heard without a stethoscope. We can also assess the uh, presence of abnormal findings in the chest through the chest wall by palpating the chest while we ask the patient to repeat the phrase 99. We know that sound is transmitted more readily through tissue that's solid compared to tissue that's well aerated. So we'll be able to detect the um, presence of consolidation in the chest wall, or sorry, in the chest, through the chest wall, as we as, as, ask the patient to pay 99. So you'd have increased vocal primitives when there's consolidation in the chest to the chest wall as the patient says 99. When the patient has uh, air trapping and excessive air there, then the premitus would be, the vocal premitus would be decreased. If there were fluid in the pearl space, then the premitus would be decreased. So that's an interesting problem. If you have consolidation of the lung up against the chest wall and you have an increase in premitus, if you have increase in aeration of the lung, as you have with emphysema and air trapping, you have a decreased premitus. If you have anything occupying, occupying the pleural space, which includes air or fluid, premitus would be decreased. One other finding that your author points out in this part of the discussion is crepitus. 
And that's an important, very important. How important is it? Mm, very important. Finding when we have air under the skin surface. It's also known as subcutaneous or sub-Q emphysema. And why, the reason that that's so important is because that may be evidence of uh, barrel trauma in the chest from positive pressure breathing. As air dissects its way from the lung through the mediastinum and under the skin, and it can be quite extensive and impressive. By itself, subcutaneous emphysema is cosmetic, but when it is present, it's a, it's a finding that requires further investigation as to what may be causing it. As your author points out, for example, while it may be a consequence of a serious problem with barrel trauma with positive pressure ventilation, it could also be related to a procedure such as a tracheostomy or injuries, penetrating injuries to the lung with knife wounds or gunshot wounds. Okay, so that's our discussion of Premitus. This particular illustration just points out how you would uh, systematically evaluate the chest by palpation, both on the anterior and posterior aspects of the chest. Similar to the way we auscultate the chest, although we usually start at the bottom with auscultation. Okay, next slide we'll discuss chest excursion to determine sym symmetry um, by palpation. So in a, we often refer to the symmetrical and bilateral expansion of the chest by observation and inspection. We also want to be able to evaluate the patient's symmetrical movement of the chest by palpation by placing each hand over the patient's posterior lateral chest with the thumbs meet at the midline of dot TA to T10 posteriorly, as I said, posterior lateral. We instruct the patient to exhale slowly uh, and completely after and then inhaling deeply. As the patient is inhaling, the examiner evaluates the distance that each thumb moves from the midline. Normally each thumb tip moves about three to five centimeters from the midline. That's posterior assessment of the symmetrical movement of the chest. And we move around to the front of the anterior part of the patient's chest and enter a lateral placement of the hands. Meeting with the thumbs meeting at the midline along the costal margins near the xiphoid process. Again, asking the patient to exhale slowly and then completely, and then to inhale deeply, and noting as to the movement of the thumbs from the midline. It's another important um, technique to understand regarding the evaluation symmetrical expansion of the chest. For example, the patient had atelectasis that was significant to say that again the endotracheal tube had slipped into the right main stem bronchus with significant atelectasis of the left lung, then we would expect that the right lung would expand more than the left lung would. And that would be so that would be true for any extensive involvement of one lung or the other. We'd expect it to be opposite lung or sometimes referred to as the contralateral lung to expand more than the affected lung. Okay, so that will bring us to the end of this part of the lecture on systematic examination of the lung, chest and lungs. The next part will take up auscultation and um, percussion. Okay, so I thank you for your attention and we'll move on to the next part of this lecture.